So these guys talked me into coming here. I really wasn't. Uh, it's in between two things. And so Thursday, I had to be at Caltech until late and took an overnight flight here. I didn't really look at the schedule, and but I made a talk kind of between leaving an event at Caltech and going to the airplane, which last night I threw away. So I, it was a visionary talk. <coughs> but I decided that uh, this meeting is too visionary in my mind. And uh, so I'm going to give a nuts and bolts talk about really what uh, it's completely threw away my slides and started again last night. So it isn't what I thought I'd talk about, but it is. Now, what I want to say is first a caveat. Goal is one of the goals, of course, is to get to something that looks like this from LIGO and its partners in gravitational waves. Uh, I'm not trying to be pessimistic in this talk, but more realistic. I, I don't see any obstacles to eventually getting to the goals that we talk about. So the fact that I'm going to talk about problems and issues and things that we have to solve, and the fact that it's probably the, the schedules that we give aren't real, real, realistic, uh, shouldn't be taken as that we have big problems. So don't walk out with feeling that. I don't think that at all, but I'm just going to kind of lay it out to you, or at least my view of where the difficulties are and how we're going to get to eventually something like this. I, I did hear one thing yesterday which stuck in my mind, and that is that Tony's given us more latitude. We can be 100 square degrees, and I remember him saying that, <laughs> and we'll stick him to it because yeah. I think it's going to be hard to get to this. And the final, if tar, uh, uh, target is something like 2022 in my mind, which is when LSST is supposed to be moving into its real things. So in that spirit, positively, I'm going to talk about kind of problems and negative things. So let me remind you what limits LIGO first. Uh, this is the sensitive region. And uh, basically, there's all kinds of things that limit us that we have to talk about. A few of those I'll bring up. But we're limited by, at the highest frequencies, so this is the frequency, it's the audio band, obviously. And we're limited at the highest frequencies by shot noise, or photostatistics, photo basically. At the lowest frequencies by the uh, shaking of the earth or seismic noise. And this falls like frequency to the fourth power, so it's incredibly steep. And in the intermediate ones by thermal noise, which is basically the fact that at present, we're, we're working at room temperature, so we have KT noise. Uh, eventually, we can improve this by not working at room temperature and so forth. And all the lines underneath it are just the practical things that we deal with, and I'll talk about some of those. So this is a graph that we could have drawn in the 1990s. And uh, going through all the steps, which I'm not going to talk about, to being as good as we could with what we built, starting with the money that NSF gave us in 1994, by uh, sobering, but by almost uh, 15 to 20 years later, this is what we achieved. The little line, by the way, is what was in the, the uh, slides that I showed the National Science Board in 1994 when they approved us. So except for the lowest uh, frequencies, uh, we pretty much hit the target. But it took a long time, which is kind of the, the, what I'm going to say about advanced LIGO in the same spirit. This is two different lines for the two different uh, last data mm -hmm. runs that we took, the, the two colors. Um, where we had a different, somewhat different configuration. I, I'm not, not going to talk about those. And to remind you, these little lines that stick up are mostly resonances that are in any mechanical and electrical system, some of them electrical, uh, uh, different reflections of 60 hertz, say, and uh, the, the fact that we have all kinds of mechanical uh, ge geometric things that uh, cause these, these, these take up of maybe 1% of the total frequency band and are almost all uh, basically pretty stationary. And so for today's talk, you can just think they, they can get notched out without changing it very much. So I'm going to ignore them. Uh, now, the goal of advanced LIGO and the goal to get to where we're going is to increase this broad uh, uh, frequency response by a factor of 10 at least a factor of 10 everywhere. And a factor of 10, I'll remind you, for the kind of sources we're talking about here, 
means that uh, we see the sensitivity, if it's a factor of 10 better, means we see a factor of 10 further out or a factor of 10 cubed in rate. So, uh, so that was the goal, to get a factor of basically 1,000 in, in rate for most of these things. And uh, the, the life is a little more complicated than that, but if, than what I'll say, but the, in simple terms, the way to improve high frequency is to improve the source of the photons, the number of photons, and so a higher power laser is what gives you the, the gain at high frequencies. In the middle frequencies, uh, we aren't good enough yet to go to low temperature, so we, do, we make a better suspension and, te and test mass materials and better coatings and improve things in the region of the thermal noise, and at low frequencies, better seismic isolation. So that's the rough uh, uh, goals of advanced LIGO as we proposed it. We actually were fortunate enough to convince the NSF, or I was, in 1994, that we weren't building the final instrument from the beginning, uh, that we couldn't because there was too much risk in not being able to succeed. Most of the ideas of how to do all this we knew at that point, but hadn't basically, it was such a big step to even initial LIGO that, that the strategy really was to take it in two steps, to try it as much as possible in initial LIGO, uh, make an instrument that relied on technologies that we'd at least tested in the labs. And, advanced Li and for advanced LIGO, we would develop the technologies uh, as we went along. So they approved, actually, which didn't happen after advanced LIGO, unfortunately. Uh, they approved funding to keep the technical staff that designed and built initial LIGO going. And we designed advanced LIGO between the time we finished initial LIGO, which was 1999, and 2003. So it's a long time ago. We basically uh, finished the used the same team to design uh, and make uh, lab tests on all the main features that are in Advanced LIGO, and took it to the NSF in 2003. And Advanced LIGO was basically approved in concept by review committees in the NSF in 2004, and uh, uh, but it took you know four or five more years before we got funding from. Uh, the MREFC program. So uh, that's the scheme. <coughs> now a little bit more of the issues and the details I'll work my way into. This is the test masses for advanced LIGO. They're made out of fused silica. And uh, if you look at it with your eye, it's the purest piece of, beautiful, pure piece of glass you ever saw. Uh, you see right through it, of course. They have, a co they have coatings on the surface that are, I think, 20 layers of a dielectric coating that is uh, picked for a variety of features, but of course the main one is to reflect the light at 1064 nanometers, the frequency we work at. So it reflects light at 1064, which is not visible. It's in the infrared, so to our eyes it's just clear glass and we see through it. One of the problems um, is that picking this coating and matching it to the uh, a uh, few silica has an interface problem. Different expansions of coefficient and, and uh, uh, an interface problem, which we've dealt with forever and we don't have that optimized. And it's one of the problems of what to do as we improve the optics and one of the things that we hope to spend enough effort on in the next few years uh, to improve on and replace these test masses, which are not ideal. Uh, these are the best that could be made outside. We have to develop a better team inside to see what the next uh, steps are. The test masses are, of course, the mirrors that are used at the end. And uh, we let through 98.6% of the light reflects back and forth, so 1.4%. And they make, uh, basically, to build up the light in, inside here. Uh, see, anything else I want to say here? No, basically, that's enough. Uh, the suspension system for advanced LIGO looks like this, and it's tricky. For initial LIGO, we hung the initial LIGO test masses from piano wire, because we didn't know any better. We developed uh, a few silica wires and how to bond them in the, this <coughs> period, in the early 2000s, and uh, moved what was initially the, the uh, noise 
source, which is we had the test masses and then used magnets and actuators to be able to keep, on a, keep it locked on a fringe uh, by measuring the wave fronts and seeing that it, where it moved. But that created noise. So the whole scheme now is to have a multiple pendulum. It's really functionally four la layers where you control the bottom layer, moved as much as possible the electronics and noise making issues off the bottom layer and moved them to the upper layers. But of course it has the difficulty that we're trying to control where this is from moving things above it. So it's a tricky problem. This was developed primarily in Glasgow. And this is the test mass down in the corner. Uh, this is the, the high power laser. Uh, for initial LIGO, we had a laser that was single line, neodymium YAG laser that was 20 watts. And for advanced LIGO, we developed a laser that's 200 watts and also worked with uh, a commercial company to make it, let's say, commercially hard so we didn't have a laboratory like laser that uh, we were fixing all the time. That's the <coughs> idea. This is what it looks like. It's a uh, uh, neodymium YAG laser stabilizing uh, primarily in power and frequency. And it uses a monolithic uh, master oscillator and yeah, inj it's injection locked. Okay. So we put this all together. I'm not going to go through any more technical details of uh, putting it together, but more kind of dealing with now trying to make it do what I said it's supposed to do. We put it all together by uh, <coughs> mid-2014 and started commissioning it. What's shown here is basically what we talked about in the last day, the neutron star, the agreed to neutron star in spiral range uh, versus time, basically. And this is the commissioning which started in uh, Livingston. We basically uh, concentrated on one at a time, started in Livingston and made steps up. Here's the 20 uh, uh, megaparsec line, which was the best we ever achieved for initial LIGO. So within a month or so, we crossed that and improve slowly up to uh, where you've seen it for, for uh, uh, the, S, the first uh, 01 data run, which is about 70 megaparsecs. We went, then went to, well, in the last steps, went to Hanford, and you can see how much faster it turned on because of the learning experience that we had here. So this is all very good, and in fact, we were happy to start the 01 run as long as we achieved at least a factor of two better than we had in an initial LIGO, and we did quite a bit better than that, so maybe we got cocky. Uh, and basically, this is where the initial LIGO run started. When I come to advance the uh, next data run, you'll see we didn't do as well. So let's see where we were. So at this point, we'd improved. This is the sensitivity that I showed you from initial LIGO, and we basically improved it a factor of three broadband instead of a factor of two, and that's what I, what I showed you. But note that at the low frequencies, we actually improved the factor of 100, let's say 50 hertz. That's the factor and the reason we were able to de detect the black hole binaries, as I'll show you. If you want to give the elevator speech, it's one thing, which is the low frequency improvement of a factor of 100, which is then a factor of 100 cubed in rate, and why we had years of running and not seeing anything, and now we're capable of seeing something, and I'll show you uh, how that uh, a little bit more of that. What caused that? What, what it was, was again, what we did in initial LIGO compared to advanced LIGO. What we did in initial LIGO to isolate ourselves from the ground was make the best passive isolation system we could do, which is basically what's in your car, but better. So we made these squishy springs that took any bump and moved it to lower frequency. Four stages, uh, but nothing active. We actually did a little bit active outside the vacuum in Louisiana because we had trouble with, cut, with trees getting cut down. But the real active system which is inside vacuum, and it's in layers, and it's basically, if you just want to think about it, it's like the, what's done in the earphones you put on in an airplane. It measures the ambient background and corrects for it. But the problem's harder for us. First, we have to do it more sensitively, and secondly, we have to do it directionally. We have to know where the shaking's coming from. And so we developed a six-dimensional system, basically the linear dimensions and rotations in each one to co cover the space space, and designed it on your drafting tables, and made the instrumentation, which, by the way, has commercial applications, we think, because it's very good, although expensive, 
to make very stable tables, say, for microelectronics. Okay, so we made the, uh, uh, we developed this scheme. The hard part is that you have, in our case, six dimensions, and you design it on an engineering table. And, but if you put it in situ, it doesn't look like the engineering table. You look up and it's sky, you look down, and in Louisiana it's water, and you look, you know, it's different in different directions. So the problem is, compared to the earphones in your airplane, is that we have to know what direction it is and correct for it, which means we have to basically diagonalize the matrix. And how do you diagonalize the matrix? That's a very hard problem. It's very time consuming. We have to measure all the wave fronts. We have to understand everything in situ. And so that's a long process. But we're in the process of doing that. But that's why we haven't achieved yet design when you look at it. So anyway, we put this in. We did it at more or less the nominal work that it made it a little bit better. And we got these, which you've seen, which I'm not going to talk about, but this beautiful event that showed up with the line drawn through it from numerical relativity. And, uh, and that's great. Uh, this is only possible, as I indicated, because of the low frequency improvement. So this is, the, this is basically the frequency versus time of the, that event, and the event, which we don't see quite as well, which is the event that occurred on Boxing Day, so the second event. And again, you, don't, you wouldn't see this part here or this part here if we hadn't improved the low frequency. So that was the key. Everybody should realize that. And that's the elevator speech. What isn't told very often is we were actually worse than Virgo at low frequencies before we did advanced LIGO. So confession. This is our, this is our graph. This is the one from Virgo. And you notice at low frequencies, they're better. They had these very high towers, a very, very fancy passive system, and were better than us. So nature could have been such that they saw something and we didn't actually at the very low frequencies. And this is a story usually not told. And in fact, embarrassing to me, our technical article on initial LIGO cuts off here in the graph, which I think is somewhat dishonest. And so you don't see that, <laughs> I should. Okay, so basically, now unfortunately, in improved Virgo, they, don't, they didn't go to active isolation. They couldn't very easily in this system. So they're not going to be as good as us at low frequencies. And you see that when you look carefully. It doesn't matter for what we're talking about here, but they're not going to do as well on binary black holes or anything that requires the low frequencies as we are. So we used to be worse, but now we're better than they are and are going to remain better than they are. So this is what you've seen as the, let's say, idealized goals of LIGO in turning on. And we, we concentrated on this first data run, which was fantastic. And we, we were in this top blue area for, for LIGO. This is Virgo's plans. And, uh, and we were pretty much on the, the optimistic side of it. For the second data run, we show a shaded line, the second one, and we're basically there because we got there for the first data run, but we didn't get much improvement. And I'm going to try to show you why and what we know about it. And then we're supposed to keep improving until we basically have the sensitivity we need to maybe detect. We've heard something about the rates for, for things that will give partners, like uh, um, binary neutron star systems or neutron star black hole systems. Uh, and the rest of the time, uh, let me talk about that. I can't comment very much on Advanced Virgo or Cagra because they're virtual in my mind. The kind of problems I'm talking about, they haven't confronted yet. Uh, the best that Virgo got in the initial running was uh, in range was 10 megaparsecs. We were about 20. So we were about twice as good as them then. We've done a much more extensive rebuild than, than they have, but this is their, their design. As I say, worse at low frequencies, but a lot of gain at high frequencies. And you can do your own analysis of how well they'll do, but uh, I don't know. And again, Cagra has gone beyond us in some ways. They're underground, which is better for seismic, but unfortunately, they put in a seismic system which is not as fancy as ours. So they're, they're not gonna show much better. I think I have theirs. No, I have it later. Uh, <clears throat> but they have a, a, a potentially big gain by going to low temperature. Going to low temperature is not trivial. Uh, you've got to somehow <coughs> get the heat out of these mirrors. 
without shaking them. And so it's a hard problem to, to try, and the materials, there's new material problems. How do you make up the kind of reflectivity and mirrors that you want at low frequency? But it's great that they're doing it, because even if they don't do as well as we'd like, we're gonna learn how to do, how to go to low temperature, and they're, they're uh, doing it. We saw this yesterday. This is the present uh, uh, ability, which is not just a ring in the sky, but better than that, you heard why. Uh, which is unfortunately well beyond, almost an order of magnitude beyond what uh, Tony said is what we need for him. Uh, and this one showed what happens if you add Virgo, not exactly what happens if you add something that's had this, I think what's done here is the same sensitivity as LIGO in the Virgo location. And for the first event it was great because of where it was located, but maybe not so good on, on the other events. Okay. This is Kagra, and it's hard to know or to comment on what it'll take to do this, but I think one thing is certain that it'll take long, a longer probably than they're uh, saying. Somebody mentioned yesterday that they've made it work, but not in the configuration, as a simple Michelson, not in the configuration that they have to for this. The Japanese government has a particularly way of treating projects which is different than we're used to here where you get over here you get funded eventually through, after some hurdles for a whole construction project in Japan they have a big hurdle at roughly the two-thirds mark in a project whether it's an accelerator or this and it's because they don't have different colors of money so the construction and 15 years of operation are all put together and so what we think of as two-thirds of the construction project is only you know a quarter of the way through the the whole thing. So they have a big hurdle then there. Accelerator people that I work with know how to handle that because we know a lot about accelerators. So they make a, a goal when they initially get it that basically is pretty much on the line that you want. Unfortunately, the Kagra people were forced into a sidestep to try to meet this goal, which is really, although somebody said they've locked a Michelson interferometer, it's really not along the line of what they're going to have to do to, to get this. So. We don't know yet how this is gonna go. They have some technical problems. The tunnel in the Kamioka mine uh, rains on them because they're below the water table. Uh, they're solving that, but there's many, many problems. They're not into the real technical problems yet. Okay, so that's the goal. We'll reflect a little bit more on that, but let me talk first more about the second data run, what we've learned, and what some of the issues are. So I showed this impressive way we got to the first data run. This is basically, without the details, the second data run. So this is getting to O2, and you can see what happened. We basically, this is positive and a good step. We basically increased our sensitivity in the Louisiana uh, interferometer by uh, up to 80 some. And so that says what you can do with this configuration as a minimum. Uh, we actually, unfortunately, I'll show why, uh, did not improve the Hanford interferometer for a bunch of uh, reasons that I'll give you a hint that they are. So uh, why we spent several months trying to do this, and we're still, I guess, technically pretty close to the goal for O2, which is you know about here. So the running for O2, we're basically on the lower end of it. I don't think we've hit anything that is fundamental, uh, so it's not like we're in trouble, but there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, let me comment that the fact that, uh, that you gain as the Q of the sensitivity changes the mindset and the strategy for off time versus on time compared to what I'm used to in particle accelerators, say the LHC. In the LHC, they want to run all the time they can because you basically are statistics limited and you gain as the square root of the number of events. In our case, we gain as the Q, which means that off time to improve things, even if you improve just a little bit, it gives you a better optimization than running long, long times. So we're quite aware of that, but when you see that we're going to be down long times, I think this we're probably not down as much as we even should be if you take that into account. This is the O2 uh, range shown for both uh, Hanford and Livingston, 68 typically for uh, H1 in Hanford, uh, 84 for Livingston. 
So Livingston's somewhat better. The difference is all down here low free, at reasonably low frequencies. Uh, at high frequencies, for different reasons, it's about the same. So uh, basically, that's the two on top of each other. The two separated, uh, this is the comparison of O2, O2 and O1 in Hanford. So what did we do in Hanford? The main, the main thing we did that changed things is that we uh, tried to raise the power of the laser. So I'm oversimplifying all the things that were done, but it's mostly what affected this. From 20 watts to 50 watts. Eventual goal is 200 watts. So we improved to 50 watts, but improving, to 50, uh, uh, improving the, uh, the power to 50 watts brought all kinds of side effects that made some things better and some worse. Overall, uh, the, the uh, uh, O2 versus O1 was worse at low frequencies for reasons that mostly are that we didn't pay attention to the low frequencies. There are some problems there. And maybe one that I'll show you in a few minutes. And at high frequencies, unfortunately, we didn't gain what we should have nominally from increasing the, the power of the laser from 20 to 50 hertz. And that's not for fundamental reasons either. It's really for reasons of all kinds of things become more difficult, including the laser itself, as you increase, <coughs> increase the laser power. There's heating in the mirrors, there's scattering, uh, which is worse, and uh, there's stability problems that you have to deal with. So uh, first, uh, O2 versus O1 in Livingston, we increased from 69 to 84. Uh, that was about a 20% improvement. We cube it, so yeah, that's good. The improvement's mostly at low frequencies, and it mostly was due to taking care of a problem that we haven't done yet in Hanford, which is trying to improve the problem of some scattered light that gets in and reduces the effectiveness. So that'll be done in Hanford. And so then we run. So this is just a random day that I took, 24-hour day of running, showing them, them being on, and going off, they don't usually stay both on. This is Hanford and better at Livingston, where this is 60 some, and so I picked the typical kind of, yeah. So um, is this due to glitches, and can you say more about your understanding? When it goes off? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to talk about it. So yesterday, somebody said our uptime was good for O2. This is the it may be good in some snapshot, <coughs> but overall it's not. The final uh, overall data, which I think is pretty up to date, maybe a couple weeks old, is, is actually less than, that says 44% for both interferometers being on at the same time. That's embarrassingly bad in my mind. Uh, the single interferometer being on is, is uh, at, when you add that, then we're up to 70 some percent. For initial LIGO, I, I don't remember the numbers very well. Some of the, my colleagues probably remember better, but I think we were approached 90% uptime on an individual interferometer, and the coincidence then is the square of that. It was close to 80% or set high 70s. Now, what is the downtime from? The main downtime is simply the fact that you go out of lock. Okay. Uh, so if we go out of lock, there's two ways to improve that. One is keep it from going out of lock, and the second is how fast do you recover when you get it, when you are out of lock. Recovering when you, we've done a lot of, lot to improve things when we uh, uh, go out of lock by having, by to, in locking, by having a pretty uh, uh, directed way to lock, to try to lock the interferometer from programmable and not some operators doing this and that. The problem, simply oversimplifying it, is that when you go out of lock, you have these mirrors, but you don't know the initial conditions. They may be doing this, they may be doing that. And so not knowing the initial conditions, when we try to lock automatically with a pretty sophisticated program, not knowing the initial conditions is a killer. So sometimes we can lock in minutes, and sometimes you just have to keep starting over and over and over again. Second problem is that once we lock, it, there's some settling time. So the total amount of time that we lose when we go out of lock typically is close to hour or hours or maybe tens of minutes. 
uh, but it's hard to make it much less than 20 and 170. But notice all at higher frequencies. We're concentrated on the higher frequencies. So it's not going to improve a lot the binary black hole rate, but maybe we'll start moving to enabling us to do the uh, binary neutron stars, which are the higher frequency. So we expect this. And then eventually we have to do more work. It's harder to, uh, to get down here. For example, with squeezed light, we have to do something to be able to, to make the effect uh, affect us at low, lower frequencies as well. I don't have the time to spend time on that. So this is roughly where we are. We did 01, somewhere between 60 and 65 and 80 megaparsecs. 02, you've seen, we, we don't, we're, we're not at 100. In here, we're just at this shaded region in the middle where we're gonna take a break. Originally, that break was envisioned as a break to let Virgo join us. They're not ready. Uh, we heard, I'm not gonna talk about them, but they're not anywhere near ready. They may join us near the end of the run. I don't think there's any way they're gonna join us unless a miracle happens with sensitivity that will really uh, affect what's done in this data run. But hopefully that'll happen soon, and I don't have a lot of insight into that. One of the problems they have is that their uh, radius of curvature, their optics is set for high power, and they're still at low, uh, uh, they're still at low power and trying to make it work, and that's a, a difficulty kind of in debugging. Anyway, uh, but I don't know that there's any fundamental problems. This is 03, which is the target that I said, and I think we've got enough handles, but it won't be until 2018 or so until we get there. I don't know yet how to project this. So, and all of this, I think, is kind of a time scale that we wrote down, but it's got some sort of dilation, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be longer for the reasons that I said. We're going to concentrate more on solving the problems than, uh, than running. Okay. There's more that we can be done, and this is the last part that I'll, I'll show here, and that is that we're gonna get eventually to somewhere like this graph here, and we're not funded yet, but there's a couple of obvious improvements we can make beyond uh, advanced, what we have built and been funded for for advanced LIGO. Those two are, one I alluded to already, and that's improved mirrors, that has reduced the thermal noise in the mirrors by having better mirrors possibly. Uh, uh, single crystal silicon instead of fused silica, we, but we've got we've got to work on that, and that's longer, a little longer time scale. But, but I'm still talking about before 2025, let's say. And frequency dependence uh, squeezing, where we squeezing is basically a way to get around radiation pressure on the mirrors as you increase the power of the lasers. Uh, so that it'll improve the low frequency. The gain that we expect is maybe another factor of 1.7, but that's a factor of five in rate. So that's available in principle. It's not funded, and the present situation in the NSF, I don't know how to judge. People are unaware, I think most of you, that we actually suffered not a great increase in funding since we discovered gravitational waves with a 10% cut, and we've had a, we've had a layoff 10% of our staff basically at Caltech and MIT. So we don't know yet, but this is tens of millions of dollars to do this second part. Yeah. What's a deadline for this? Like at what point does getting it funded sort of not matter? Yeah, I, I think the problem is that we need R&D. So we're, we're, we have, we're submitting this summer the renewal of the, of the contract. The reason we haven't made a big deal about getting cut even though we lost 10%, we haven't kept it a secret, but they're very sensitive to us talking about it. Uh, is what we really want is to get an R&D program defined to work at these two things. What it depends on is starting it, because we don't know how to do it yet. We need three, or three to five years of R&D. And so the real problem is in 2018, when we get the renewal, will we get the funding, and I'm not talking about a lot of funding, to do the R&D for this, so that we, in the early 2020s we could uh, do the, the squeezing, yeah. Is this MREFC? No, no, this oh. is much less. Yeah. This is probably $30 million improvement. It's, it's, it's uh, they've started in the NSF what they call mid-scale yeah. programs. Uh, Ice Cube has just proposed one and, and we would in two or three years. So that would be the idea. If it's MREFC, uh, it would be unrealistic, I think, at this, at this stage. It's a pretty saturated program. Okay. Uh, let me just end with something I showed yesterday so I can skip over it. Uh, that is that, to me, 
I was shocked that, and pleased by something, which is usually we have problems we didn't expect, and that's how quickly the background drops when we do a coincidence, that this is orders of magnitude, this is the one event level, and that was our first event. So when I saw that, I was astounded, actually, that, that when, you re when you remove this event, it drops like this. Uh, the second event, I think, as everybody knows, was done the way we thought we'd see events, which is to do a match filter technique, multiplying the noise signal that you see against the various templates, uh, and it stood out as uh, events in the two interferometers. That's the second event. And pictorially, this is what we then have brought public so far. This is the first event, the biggest in terms of sensitivity, but cuts off the earliest in frequency because it was so heavy. And so that it only had, uh, I don't know, 10 or 8 or 10 or 12 cycles that we saw, depending on where you start in frequency, uh, and basically cut off early. The second event, which is this one, is the one that goes out the longest and stayed a couple seconds in the interferometer with many cycles, which, for example, for tests of general relativity, were, it was in some ways more sensitive to some of the parameters than the, uh, than the first event. And the third event that we keep talking about that is not called an event, LVT, is, is two, two, around two sigma, and it's shown here as this event here. So it's a little weaker and cuts off a little bit earlier or somewhere between. And let me just flash what you've seen. So this is what I showed yesterday, which is this fact that the coincidence drops off so quickly so that we can, and I'll, put, I'll show you numbers on the next slide, so that the three events that we talk about, the two events and the candidate event are shown here uh, versus this background that comes off quickly. In the, uh, in the, the, uh, uh, FAR calculations and the, the uh, announcements that we make of seeing a potential event, the numbers that I sh I'll show here is that if we talk about one per 100 years uh, in terms of the number of events normalized to this is 0.1 events, while if we do it one per month, it's about, I, th and I, I, think, I think you said the 50% showed probably came from the same thing. Mm -hmm. That is that uh, basically, if we reduce the number of real events we have by roughly 50%, we can set this far threshold at one per 100 years instead of one per month. And that's basically using that, that graph. Uh, so there's not a big additional gain in terms of these fast announcements, and there's no reason that we can't uh, uh, look at these other events for us longer, so it's a, it's a choice what we send out for announcements, so we can do it however you want. Uh, okay, this just quickly, these are the three events. They all have a spin for the final uh, black hole of about two thirds of the maximum. They kind of fill the space from 20 to, they're all heavy, 20 to 70. First one being so heavy was big. And this is the reason the, the signal, the primary reason the signal from the third event is in five sigma, it's just further away. So it's a, a thousand megaparsecs away while the other parameters are pretty similar so that it just is a little weaker and came down to a couple sigma. Uh, this is the best data that, I don't know, we've put in a graph of the expectations of published theory for the rate for binary uh, neutron stars and binary black holes versus our sensitivity. So what we did in 01, what we've used is shown here. And here for binary uh, black hole and neutron star. Uh, and this is the improvement. Uh, this is a higher rate. These are basically from the literature. Of course, they're not 100% independent of each other. So the binary neutron star one depends on the observation starts from the observations of what's been seen in our own galaxy, and then there's a question of what fraction you've missed, models, and uh, how typical our galaxy is, and so forth. Binary black hole, uh, neutron star black hole, of course, there's less data to rely on, but you can see where these things are. And this is not the realistic, necessarily, O2 and O3, because I've shown you what's realistic. But what we've subscribed is what we would do in O2 and O3. So you can see that O2 is not 
uh, in the region where we expect to do very well where we are, especially which is kind of on the side of it. Um, and, but hopefully for 03 we get in a region where we can start seeing uh, these events. So compared to what at least is in the literature, that's where we are. And that's my remake of yesterday's the talk. Thanks. So if you, uh, if you could uh, decide when to stop O2, when would that be? Oh, oh so, so far O2 is scheduled for good reason, I think, for a lot of good reasons, which I won't go into, to uh, now officially to go till the, uh, near the end of August. It's August 27th. Uh, I don't think, unless we find good reason, we'll extend much past that because uh, uh, basically, w what are the good reasons? The good reasons might not be improvements or problems that we found, but more that we need more time to prepare for the off time. Mm -hmm. So probably the bigger variable is what do we need to make sure that during the off time we can make good use of it rather than this run, which is pretty stable. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, we can't change things very radically during a data run because the, because of the way we measure backgrounds, uh, it isn't like an accelerator where you kind of tune it all the time to do better. We have to take this integral to measure the background. So to first order, we kind of keep things stable during the data run. Uh, from first light in initial LIGO to achieving design goal, it took uh, a number of years. Yes. And you think that that's the trouble, and this is this is harder. Even harder. We're better, but it's harder, mm -hmm. and uh, so I think uh, in 2022 we're not going to be there. I, I'm afraid, but you know, don't quote me. I, I mean, I just tried to lay out what the problems are. I, I can't prognosticate as well as I can kind of see what it takes, and it takes time to solve. I don't think there's anything I show that's fundamental. So. I, I repeat that you shouldn't go away feeling that I think we're, we have unrealistic goals. I just think it's it's a tough job from now on, and it takes going to take some time. So my guess is uh, another problem that I didn't bring up. We're unfunded for is that we're building a third interferometer in India, and that interferometer it w is boxed up. It was basically the interferometer, a copy, third copy of the interferometers that we put in a Livingston and Hanford. But as you can tell, we're doing a lot of work to upgrade what we put in initially for uh, LIGO, for, o, for, for, for advanced LIGO to move it toward where it'll be in 2022, 2024. In, uh, which means that if we want India to be equivalent to these interferometers, we've got to make the same upgrades. We've of course documented them and we can do them more efficiently, but we're not funded for it. So what we're funded for is to hand these boxes over and install them in India, but we have to be, we, we're gonna have to spend some of the same money that we're spending on initial LIGO to bring it up to the same thing. So we're, we're that's another issue that we, we're very aware of and have to solve. Tony. I'm surprised that you had Cadre coming on so early. <laughs> That's because I, I, I'm not make, going to make any editorial comments. They, they basically, I think it's a political thing on their side, to, and uh, I, I don't think it comes from any, anything factual. <laughs> As I said, they actually had to take a sidestep, because the really hard problems are for them to deal with the cryogenics, and uh, basically the noise with the cryogenics, and that, that isn't kind of what they had to demonstrate. Yeah, the funding agency keeps on demanding, and in the case of Congress, that they must run at a certain level and take data. And yeah, and so, I, mean, I don't know how. And it, what it, are the use of that? But and, and and it's not even in the configuration that you want to run in. So it's uh, it, so Tony, it's a good observation. I, I just editorially choose to talk about LIGO's problems and not theirs. Yeah. Um, so what is the probability that you may not be able to? Increase your sensitivity for the near near star binary by 2021. By 2021. Uh -huh. uh, so the question is, what's the probability we can't improve by 2021? Let me qualify because uh, we're trying to propose an instrument that would be looking for short gamma ray bursts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. Uh, okay. I, I think that that being well above 100 megaparsecs by 2021 should be in the bag easily. Being at too hard designed at 200 or beyond, uh, it's probably a lot harder because I mentioned all the different problems, things that have to come into play. 
some of them rather new. If we have to do uh, squeeze light at lower frequency, if we have to change the test masses, those are not going to happen on that time scale. Can I make a quick comment on that? If you're looking for GRBs and if GRBs are B, then our distance uh, is about 2.3 higher. Okay, take it even 1.5. We're already cutting on that. We're already, <laughs> so already beyond it. Yes. So and that's the relevant. Uh, if they are being, there's a big if. Right. Yeah. We have accounted for that, and basically, what we help us do the patient is the actual object loads. Right. No. Uh, we have. If GLBs have anything to do with Newton star mergers, there must be beams. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if no, they are being, so then. No. No. Yeah. But I mean, there's no way. If they are relevant. <coughs> In right. the sense that if they have anything to do right. with Newton star merger, just they just must be B. Okay. So case, there is no if here. Yeah. 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 Either it's completely bogus, <laughs> or they are been and the uh, Newton star mergers or Newton star black hole mergers are producing GRB. Okay. So basically, our calculations show that we'll be able to observe two periods. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just eight times. Three times, sorry, 2.3 times greater than the 70 or 80 megaparsecs that Brian was talking about. Uh, okay. So I think, I think Anything one. Else? So, so what you're saying uh, implies that we may not be able to see anything before LSSD, so that's actually. Well, know, I, there are there's uncertainties too. in the rates and there's <laughs> uncertainties on our side, so I think, you know. I see a lot of issues that we're going to solve, but I don't so see that they're fundamental. I, I never saw, well, maybe I'm mistaken, but I, I didn't see 300 megaparsecs on your slides. We don't have a goal. We don't have So uh, what is this number coming from? Yeah. yeah. I, I, if you take the, the goal, the regular goal for advanced light goes 200 or 220, <coughs> something like that. And then what I showed is two things that could make it better than that. So that's where people get to something approaching 300. We may need those to get to 200, so we don't know where we limit out. But optimistically, it's it's 300 after you do the two unfunded things that I talked about. That's improve the optics and do squeezing uh, such that it affects the low frequencies and not just the high frequencies. So those are in hand. There may be other things, but that's basically what the plan is when people talk about getting to 300. There's many Macronova uh, calculations of presented scale to 300 megaparsecs. So we should scale yeah. them down and make them brighter, which no, is good. just keep <laughs> pressuring us, but be patient. I think we, we can get there. I don't see any fundamental. If we, if we scale them down to 200, we gain a factor of two in uh, almost one nothing. <laughs> just for free. <laughs> we lose the rate, by the way. Okay, um, we're going to continue with uh, LIGO, so just a short plan.